So for those of you who tuned into the show last Tuesday, you may recall I gave out Army plus four and a half as my best bet. Big part of the handicap was I didn't think Coastal Carolina was going to give its best effort. Sure enough, the market agreed with that sentiment. The number ended up closing plus one. Army gets the outright win, no doubt about it. Now, I bring that up, not necessarily because I want to pat myself on the back here, but rather I think it's a pretty similar handicap with this Memphis Temple matchup on Friday as once again, we've got a road favorite that I feel will be pretty disinterested. Memphis, they enter in off a pretty deflating 38-34 home loss to SMU last week. What did that result do? Well, it killed any hope the Tigers had of reaching the AAC championship game. It was a real back-and-forth affair, too. Closely contested. Memphis continually fighting back to tie the game. But in the end, they just didn't have enough. And thus, I don't see them having much interest in winning this final regular season game by margin. Memphis is already bowl eligible. And there's a good chance they just wind up playing in the Liberty Bowl, which is, of course, their home stadium. So it's not like there's going to be some destination or some big bowl as a carrot dangling in front of them. Now, I know a few folks who did bet this Memphis over uh, the season win total at seven and a half. And... That bet's now cashed, and I'm glad it has because I don't want to feel bad about saying that it was a pretty lucky bet to cash, I think. The Tigers have not really been that good, guys, when you look at their resume. A lot of close wins. They beat Navy by four, Boise by three, North Texas by three, South Florida by nine, and Charlotte by six in overtime. The defense for Memphis has allowed 38 or more points in four straight games. I have never personally been... All that impressed with head coach Ryan Silverfield either. And even against a team like Temple, who admittedly is not very good, it takes a focused effort to win by double digits on the conference road. I just don't think we get that here from Memphis. This is a noon Eastern kickoff the day after Thanksgiving in a game that means absolutely nothing to them. Temple, it's not just their final home game but it's their final game of the season. They will not be going to a bowl. I expect somewhat of an inspired effort out of them. A coach in his just his second year, so the players shouldn't throw in the towel. Again, some semblance of enthusiasm. The Owls have been competitive the last two games. They only lose by four at UCF, USF, pardon me, and by 10 at UAB. That UAB game tied in the fourth quarter. For what it's worth, all three Temple wins this season, guys, have come at home. I think they could keep this one close solely based on motivation. I would lean Temple for my big game breakdown. Hey guys, Adam Trigger here. Big game breakdown today is going to come from the ACC up in chilly Chestnut Hill for a Friday noon kickoff between Miami and Boston College. Um, Listen, Jeff Halfley, props to my fellow Siena College alum, probably the only one you're ever going to find in uh, college or pro football at this point since they haven't had a football program in two decades. Uh, But he was on the hot seat coming into the season. And he started the year with a loss to Northern Illinois, nearly got beat by Holy Cross in the second game, and now he's bowl eligible. Uh, and he got BC bowl eligible ten game, uh, nine games into the season. Um, so, so that's really like a, a huge victory. And this, this weekend, in my opinion, should be a celebration of BC football to go from that and what they were the last couple of years, you know, specifically last year, uh, to a guaranteed bowl game regardless, even with the back-to-back losses the last two weeks, a guaranteed bowl game, regardless of what happens in this game, uh, I think that's a great season for Boston College. And I think they should, you know, have have reason to want to come out and play hard uh, in their season finale. Miami, on the other hand, is on the other, other side, other end of the spectrum. Uh, this is a team that had all sorts of expectations coming into the season. Um, it was, con- you know, get in that ACC title game, uh, contend for a college football playoff. And, and that just hasn't been the case um, pretty much ever since the uh, inexplicable loss to Georgia Tech. Um, of course, we all remember kneeling out the football or, or not kneeling out the clock, of course. Um, the season has gone completely downhill. And then last the last two weeks just sort of gutting performances to lose in the fashion that they lost to Florida State and to Louisville. So now you've got a Miami team that they're going to go to a bowl, but the, a win here is the difference between seven and five and six and six, really no difference at all. 
uh, especially for a team that, that really, you know, expected much more. And so this one's all about motivation for me. If, I'm not going to break the matchup down because the matchup's really sort of irrelevant here. If Miami shows up, cares about this game, really wants to play, um, they'll probably win and they'll probably win easily. But as we know, in these types of games, these season finale type games, uh, that doesn't always happen. And in this case, Miami's headed up to, to Boston. Well, right outside of Boston. Uh, where the temperature is going to be a high of 37 degrees. And it's not exactly a game teams get up for. Uh, this reminds me a lot of Syracuse last year. They were 6-5. and five. They had to head to Boston College to play their season finale. And the, their final score was extremely deceiving. Uh, they failed to cover a similar spread. Uh, I believe that went off 9.5 or 10. Uh, the final was 32-23. But it took 26 fourth quarter points for Syracuse to win that game. They trailed uh, virtually all game and, and still didn't get the cover. So, you know, Boston College, again, they kind of limp into this finale on the, on the heels of back-to-back -back losses. But I think they're going to be up for this game. Miami sort of regressed defensively. Their defense hasn't been as good as it was earlier in the year. Um, so in this spot, this is more of just a motivation you know, lack of motivation for Miami. The fact that we've seen Miami kind of struggle in this spot in years past, there was a a, a year that they went to Pittsburgh, I think either this weekend or, or maybe last weekend toward the end of the season and, and lost as a big, pretty big favorite there. It just feels like a game that could be close. I, I got to be honest, I wouldn't be that surprised if Boston College pulled the upset here. Um, it, this game feels like there could be a wide array of potential results. But when that's the case, why not take nine points um, or whatever the spread is at the moment uh, to, 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 to see if you can get on the right side of that? So very similar to last year, I cashed a 4% best bet in Boston College's season finale as a big dog. And I think they get the money again here. Uh, so Boston College plus the points. Uh, I'd love it up around nine, nine and a half. Uh, but whatever it is, I think they're going to hang around with Miami in this game. Steve Merrill back here on Wager Talk TV with a big game breakdown. History will be made on Friday when Iowa plays Nebraska because this is going to go off as the lowest over-under in the history of college football for total points on an over-under line. And we had history just two weeks ago when Iowa played um, a game against Rutgers, and that total closed around 27 and a half. Ended up 22 nothing. Rutgers shut out uh, by Iowa, stayed under the total. And the Hawkeyes have now gone under six straight. Their last over was way back September 30th, and that was a phony over. Michigan State game total 42 went over the 37, but don't forget Michigan State had a fumble return, a 42-yard fumble return in the third quarter. Otherwise, that game stays under as well. And we saw the same thing down the stretch last year with Iowa Hawkeyes. Two of their final three games last season had totals of just 31 and a half points, and those games landed with a combined score of 23 points and 21 points against Minnesota and against uh, Kentucky Bowl. So, you know, a bowl game against Kentucky, you still only have a 21 nothing game. It just shows how bad this offense is. By the way, the game that went over in between was the Nebraska game last year, and Iowa lost that game 24-17. Total was 38, and they were an 11-point favorite. So big revenge motive here for the Hawkeyes. And my database simulation does project this game as a pick -em. So I do think we get some value with Iowa at the current line of plus two. Uh, especially since this would be a very low scoring game. And look, I very ever, rarely ever recommend college football teasers because they're not advantage plays, but you could probably make an argument this is the exception because taking Iowa from plus two to up to plus eight looks like an excellent six point teaser because it is going to be an extremely low scoring game with the lowest over under in college football history. And by the way, let's talk a little bit more about that total. Open to 29 at the Circa, other spots 27, 28. As we check the Wager Talk live odds screen on Tuesday afternoon, already down to 26. There's even 25 and a halves out there. I don't even know what a key number is. Obviously, 27 and 28 are pretty key. I don't think 25 or 26 are exactly live totals. But if you're going to play the total, I know it's hard to do, but you have to look at the under. Uh, games uh, below 36 and a half or less. Ralph Michaels pointed this out a couple months ago. I think they were on an 80% run about a month ago. Um, and that was a, a 20 and five underrun. And that Michigan State game was briefly a 36 and a half when Ralph posted that stat back in September. And once again, it closed 37, had the phony over. But yeah, let's look at Iowa here since then. The six straight unders 
And every five of those six games, including the last five, have all had totals of 34 or less. And they totaled 21 points, 22 points, 17 points, 22 points, 28 points. Yeah, they got close last week. Uh, but under, I know it's hard to pull the trigger, but under 26 is probably the play here. I'd also lean towards Iowa plus two, and I do like them as a teaser up to plus eight. And by the way, check out the solo game videos for Thursday here in NFL. I gave you teaser recommendations in both Packers, Lions, and even Commanders, not my Washington Commanders against the Dallas Cowboys. So there's some other teaser recommendations here on Wager Talk TV that you can use with the Hawkeyes on Friday if you're going to play this game. Uh, best of luck. And once again, his history will be made with the lowest total ever in college football. All right, guys, TCU is really a fascinating team to look at over a two-year stretch. We all remember last season at this time, think back, TCU undefeated and getting ready to play the Big 12 championship game, which they'd lose to Kansas State in overtime, but the Horn Frogs would, of course, go on to the college football playoff anyway, stun Michigan in the semifinal before obviously getting waxed by Georgia in the national championship game. And I remember spending a bulk of 2022, as many of the cappers here at Wager Talk did on the various shows, talking about how fortunate TCU was. Well, predictably, the regression monster has come in 2023. The team just five and six this season. But ironically enough, I think the Horned Frogs are one of the unluckiest teams in the country this season. There's a luck metric that I look at, and TCU right now is actually 132nd out of 133 FBS teams in the luck rating, ahead of only East Carolina. Last year in that luck rating, they were number one. So they go from the luckiest to the second unluckiest team in the country in just a one-year span. Funny how that can work out. But at five and six, straight up, coming into this final game, obviously TCU must win. The problem with Friday, they're at Oklahoma. It's easier said than done winning in Norman. But I will say this about the Big 12. To me, you have a top tier that's Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas State not Oklahoma State, the team that might be playing spoiler uh, in the Big 12 championship game. In the second tier, you have teams like Oklahoma State and Kansas who aren't as good as their records, in my opinion, while teams like TCU and Texas Tech certainly better than their records from where I sit. And among teams that are not bowl eligible, I have TCU power rated as the best nationally. I don't think there's a better five-win team in America that's uh, certainly not something you want to write on your resume, but it's the case, I think, with the Horn Frogs. And in my big game breakdown, I talk, if you wouldn't go back and, and think about that, I talked about the issue of motivation with Memphis and Temple. Well, there's a good chance Oklahoma doesn't even get to the Big 12 title game as they need not only a win here on Friday, but also Oklahoma State to lose as a 17-point favorite at home to BYU on Saturday. That's probably not happening. So I wonder what the OU mindset is coming into this regular season finale. Now, am I saying TCU pulls the outright upset? No, not necessarily, but I think they keep it close against the Sooners team that has not been playing well for a while. Everyone thought Brent Venables had this defense fixed, but a lot of points been given up by OU down the stretch. I faded this team against UCF. They only won by two there. Then I faded them at Kansas, where they lost outright last week. They only win by seven at BYU, despite a plus three turnover margin. They were even outgained in that game. And yes, Oklahoma's signature win against Texas looks very nice, considering what the Longhorns have done this season. But remember, that game-winning drive only came about because Steve Sarkeesian really mismanaged the clock down the stretch. You look at TCU's offense, 531 yards last week in midly against Baylor. But I think we get enough offense from the underdog here to stay within single digits in Norman. TCU plus 10 is my best bet for the show today. All right, let's go to the Mountain West for my best bet, Utah State, New Mexico. And kind of like I was talking about before uh, when I was talking about Boston College and Miami, this is kind of like the just the why not weekend, right? Like New Mexico plus the points, why not? Like why, they, why, why can't they win this game? They went and beat Fresno State as a three-touchdown underdog last week. Um, this team's not going to go to a bowl game. They're four and seven, uh, but they've got all sorts of momentum for playing great last week. And I don't, you know, I don't see why they wouldn't be able to come and show up again. You know, these are almost the, the more dangerous teams. Like if you're a Utah state and you need to win to become bowl eligible, the, the more dangerous teams to play in this like finale situation are the ones that still care 
but aren't going to a bowl game. And that's New Mexico. Uh, they have nothing to lose here. They're four and seven. They're not going to go to a bowl. Uh, but it's their it's their final home game of the regular season. They just had a great win, so they're trending in the right direction. The the best win of their season last week. And um, you know, they they're gonna, in my opinion, why wouldn't they show up for this game? Now, Utah State. They need the win. They, they, they're in that sort of like overrated spot of they need the win to get to a bowl game. And people sometimes equate that with, okay, well, they're going to win. Uh, but Utah State's got some concerns coming into this game. Um, they were on quarterback number three at one point last week. Uh, Cooper Legas was hurt or left the game hurt. Hillstead got hurt. Levi Williams was in there. So first of all, props to Utah State for even having like three capable quarterbacks. A lot of these these Mountain West teams don't. Um, but still, I mean, Levi Williams, former Wyoming quarterback, in there at the end. I'm not sure who Utah State is going to end up with under center here, but I'm also not sure it matters because you're either going to probably get a banged up uh, Legas or Hillstead, or you're going to have Levi Williams, who, who's sort of proven on a number of occasions that, that he's not a starting quarterback for an FBI, starting caliber quarterback for an FBS team. So I'd be pretty much willing to play against all three of them. And then there's just injuries up and down the Utah state roster. I mean, it, it goes far past the quarterback position, how banged up this team is. Their defense has been, you know, it has not been good. Um, and now they've got some injuries on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, they've been horrific against the run this year. Uh, Boise state dropped 350 on them last week, um, you know, on the ground. And this is a New Mexico, uh, New Mexico team that moved the ball without much issue against Fresno State. So, uh, you know, I like to fade the uh, quote unquote team needs to win to get to a bowl game narrative. Uh, I typically think the odds makers overvalue teams purposely in that spot because they know that that team is going to draw the majority of the action. Uh, this has gotten bet down a little bit, uh, but I think if you could find a six and a half it's still pretty good value even at six it's probably fine i probably wouldn't play this lower than six uh but if you give me a touchdown here with the home team i think it plays i wouldn't be surprised if new mexico won this game but if not i think it's close enough uh to get the money either way let's look at a free play for friday college football here this friday the day after thanksgiving it's a huge college football card i think there's a good situation here with some line value and a substantial matchup advantage as well we're going to get to that in just a moment quick reminder though you can get seven days and nights of all sports best bets on my page this week and this week only for an instant 30 percent discount no promo code needed it's the 69 dollar seven day all sports special right now at wagertalk.com that works out to less than ten dollars a day for every football and basketball play and that offer is good this week only. So don't delay. Check that out on my page, Steve Merrill, wagertalk.com. All right, free play here for Friday in college football. Afternoon game at 4 o'clock Eastern. We're going to take a look at Boise State minus the 6.5. Briefly saw some 7s out there when it opened. But as of Tuesday afternoon, already 6.5 across the board. And I like that line value. My 10,000 game simulation through the database has, on average, Boise State winning this one by 11. And part of the reason it has that much of a margin is because of the matchup here. Air Force is a team that obviously runs the ball basically every play. But Air Force is a team that was extremely lucky. You know, Brian Power mentioned the luck metric in college football, and it is something I'd like to look at as well. In fact, Air Force, back when they started 8-0, and were ranked 16th out of 133 teams as the luckiest teams in college football. They've now lost three straight games. And guess what? They're all the way down to number 80. Boise State, though, playing excellent football, back-to-back -back wins and coverage, yet they're still 120 on the luck index. So I think there's some upside still with Boise, and that's why this line is too short. But the matchup favors Boise State here. They're dominating the line of scrimmage the last couple of weeks, 87 points, and they've put up over 600 yards rushing, almost 600, about 580 to be exact in those two wins. And yes, Air Force runs the ball well also, but Boise's strength this year has been stopping the run. Their weakness has been their pass defense. In fact, they have a very bad pass defense, which obviously will not be a problem against an Air Force team that, by the way, when they were 8 0, they were averaging four pass attempts per game, and then they got down big against Army, had to throw the ball 24 times. They're now averaging seven pass attempts per game, but they're not a team that can play from behind, and this will be the first time Air Force is an underdog all season after 11 games. And yes, they had 10 turnovers in those losses against Army in Hawaii. Last week, though, they didn't turn the ball over, and they still lost outright as a home favorite to UNLV. 
This appears to be a team that's wearing down. Boise appears to be a team heading in the opposite direction, and we get some line value as well. Take a look at Boise State minus the six and a half at four o'clock Eastern on Friday afternoon. And don't forget to get my best bets every day and save while you do so. Get the seven day all sports special this week and this week only for just $69. No promo code needed. Check it out. Steve Merrill, wagertalk.com.